I'd love to start by telling you the story of a little girl who fell in love with what in her eyes was the most beautiful sport in the world. It was a sport that was completely based off merit, that was really challenging her mental toughness, and that each time that she set foot on that tennis court, she realized that it made her, her. And this little girl started playing when she was four years old, so she worked countless hours under the burning Miami sun, enduring lots of happiness and tears and wins and losses. But most of all, she was undergoing a physical battle with her own health just to reach her dream of becoming a professional tennis player. Anytime someone would ask her, what do you want to be when you grow up, her answer was consistently that her dream was to play professionally. But life has this funny way of creating storms and throwing them your way when you least expect it, just to see how well you can learn to dance in the rain. And that's exactly what happened to her. When she was 10 years old, she was diagnosed with severe scoliosis, which is a progressive abnormal curvature of the spine that really has no explanation as to why or where it comes from. This didn't stop her. It actually made her fight twice as hard just to prove it to herself and prove it to her diagnosis that she could still make it to her dreams. So she was undergoing a bunch of different forms of physical therapy. She was wearing a plastic brace for 20 out of the 24 hours per day. And although her deformity was very evident and it created a lot of insecurities for her, a lot of anxieties, and a lot of overall things that a 10-year-old should not have to go through, she continued to fight very hard because she knew that as soon as she would set foot onto that tennis court, all of these worries and these anxieties, they would all fade away. But life didn't think that was enough, and when she was 14 years old, her spine had reached a curvature of greater than 70 degrees. And the only option that she had left at that point was undergoing a very major, very invasive surgery called the serious spinal fusion with instrumentation. Her spine was completely ripped apart and rebuilt using two metal rods and 26 screws. And I think the picture does it justice to see how invasive the surgery is. This was not only very dangerous for her to go through, but it was a very traumatic event for her from the adjustment of her very previously active lifestyle to being a baby, being a baby in the body of a 14-year-old. She had to learn how to walk again, how to sit down again, how to do all of the daily life activities that we so easily take for granted. She had to learn how to do them all over again. And the worst part of all was accepting and coming to terms with the fact that she would no longer be able to do what made her her. And that little girl was me, and today I'd really love to share with you how I was able to heal myself by helping others. It took me a little bit to realize that too often we're the victim of our own improperly processed past experiences, or experiences that we quite frankly haven't had the time to digest at all. I had surgery in November, and from November to January to April to May, I always had a smile on my face. And when someone would ask me how I was doing, I would simply shrug my shoulders and say I was doing okay. And when they asked me about my pain, I said I had none, even though inside I was dying for how excruciating and inhabilitating my pain was. But I did this for the sole purpose that in my mind, the goal that was pushing me forward was that in six months, when I was technically supposed to be healed, I would return to the tennis court, and I would just be able to do my dream again, just and with a healthy back. So every day I'd create small goals from learning how to sit for 30 seconds to sitting for 45 seconds, walking one block, walking two blocks, taking a shower by myself, all small goals that were helping me to try and reach normality again for that one day where I would return to the tennis court. And at that six month mark, when I did return to the tennis court and I realized that I was physically incapable to do my dream and normality was something that I could no longer achieve, my world completely fell on me. And I began living a non-functioning life. My life began with me going to school because I was forced to, but then I would come home and sit on the floor of my bathroom where I'd have some privacy and just cry. Cry and ask myself why. Why is this the life that I have? What did I do wrong that this is in my hands? But I had no answer. For years I didn't have an answer. And it was took until one day where I got up and I looked at myself in the mirror with a feeling of such disgust towards myself saying, what are you doing with your life? Has your life really come to just sitting on the floor and crying? And I felt as if I had failed everyone, my parents, myself, my family, everyone around me, because I was not able to get up from what I was going through. And so that's when I really decided that it was time to take matters into my own hands and make a difference, to use all of my anger, all of my pain, all of my suffering, and put it towards some things that may be something bigger than what tennis was. 
And that's where my journey on Nicholas Children's Hospital started. I returned to my doctor, Dr. Schuffelberger, and I asked him if I could volunteer with him. And I was absolutely blessed with him this answer when he said yes. Because in doing so, I got to meet so many patients that were undergoing the same thing that I had gone through. And I became a face of a living proof, a living hope of what was going to happen to these kids. I would sit with them before the surgery, during and after, and they'd sit there and ask me, can I touch your back? Can you do some jumping jacks for me? Can you give me your perspective from a patient? And I was beyond thrilled, and that feeling that I had when they smiled at me after I sat with them started to make a little bit of sense to me as to why I was going through certain things. From there, I became an ambassador for Nicholas Children's Hospital, where I speak on their behalf to raise money to fuel the vision to always be where the children are. We are blessed to have a miracle working hospital right in our backyard. And so it is my passion and my privilege to be able to speak for them because in all of this, I was also able to uncover another passion that I had that before I maybe would have never found, and that was public speaking. From there, though, I decided how I first started to see that electrifying glimpse of how my story had the capacity to help others, that I wanted to expand my work beyond those four walls of the hospital. And I started traveling to different countries in Latin America, specifically in Mexico, Colombia, and the Dominican, Dominican Republic. And I noticed one common thing between all of these countries is the misery that surrounds the poverty and the poor areas. Misery in the sense of youth prostitution, drug abuse, sexual violence, physical violence, in the face of innocent little kids. And that's where I created a non-for-profit foundation called James Will Not Die in honor of one of the first little boys that we saved, where my mission is to really clean up the tank of the water. The analogy I use with my kids is I'm there and I'm cleaning the fish tank because there's little fishies that are trying to breathe and swim, but they can't because of how murky their water has become. So in Mexico, I brought telemedicine to a foster care orphanage so that I could save them the trip of going to a hospital when sometimes it's the majority of the time unnecessary. So with something just as big as an iPhone, we can get them access to medical care. Then when I went to Colombia, I worked with parents of malnourished kids who unfortunately they cannot and they do not have the financial means to raise them up. So we teach them little things like learning how to cut hair in the salon to simple nutrition as to what a carbohydrate is, what a protein is, to tell them what their kids need to be brought up. And where I do the majority of my work is in the Dominican Republic in a small little town called Boca Chica, where I work with an orphanage of 90 girls who have all unfortunately been sexually abused. And these girls, I provide them with educational and psychological support. Educational so that they, they can have the option in their life to do something better once they get out of where they are. And psychological because no girl, no boy, nobody in their life should have to be exposed to what they unfortunately have been exposed to. And so these are the three countries that I'm working with right now, but I hope to expand my work because there is no greater feeling that I've gotten than working with these kids and working at the hospital and that little feeling of fulfillment that you get when you help someone else. Now, I'm not saying my journey has been easy. It's not easy, not even now. I still, unfortunately, suffer from chronic pain. There's not a day that I can get up and say, wow, I feel great today. There isn't. But I use all of that to continue to fuel me in my passion and helping others. Because through all of this and through my work, I was able to realize and to learn that my mission in life was not to play tennis. Tennis was just a pathway leading me to realize that my life is devoted to helping someone else. Now, every time that I thought I was getting better and instead I was taking three steps back, every time I was upset and I would cry and I would continue asking myself why, today I have an answer. And that answer is to help someone else. Now, all of us at one point or another are going to undergo a physical or an emotional hurricane. It's unfortunately the way life is. But with that, we need to be aware and realize that we cannot escape to look for an answer because the answers are always within ourselves. And when we look within ourselves and realize what it is that we truly like and we truly love in life, we can radiate that positivity to everybody else. And change is hard, I'll be honest with you. Change is very hard because we're so comfortable and we underestimate the power of what is the unknown. We are afraid of not knowing, but you have to realize that when you let go and you don't know, you will start living again because you will be able to uncover and find certain things that were hidden in your comfort zone. So I encourage you to go out of your comfort zone and find something that truly makes you who you are. All of us have a passion in life, whether it be singing, dancing, tennis, whatever it may be. We all have something and with that passion we have a unique gift and that gift is to be able to help someone else. 
It doesn't have to be something monumental. It can simply be just smiling at someone, sending positivity someone's way, not judging someone. We live in a society that is so fast-paced all the time that we often forget to stop and say, how can I help the person next to me? If we all do that and we multiply it by millions, this society will become much better than what it is now. Because we unfortunately have to make sure that our egoistic side starts meeting our altruistic side. And once all of us come together in altruism, that is precisely where the beauty of humanity is. It is the power of us coming together to unite and help someone else to make something beautiful together. And lastly, I want to leave you with an image that I think really encompasses my journey and it encompasses probably all of our journeys at one point or another in our lifetime. And this is a beautiful lotus flower. This beautiful flower is only able to rise and become this beauty once it has gone through mud and darkness. And just like us, we will only be able to radiate our positivity into the world once we have gone through some of the most darkest and trying times. Because that is when we really discover who it is that we are. And remember, if you take anything away from my talk today, when you help someone else, when you give someone else hope, in actuality, the person who is benefiting the most from your act of kindness is you. <laughs>